Hi, welcome to How to d d My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. In Dungeons and Dragons 5e, the topic for today is avoiding an asteroid. No, it's not really about that. We're not trying to do that at all. No, we're going to talk about natural hazards in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Quite an exciting topic. I actually really like the idea of using natural disasters and natural hazards in my game. I'm sure you're exactly the same way. This is why you're actually watching the video in the first place. So here's the thing. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything briefly explains, well, should I say expands on what is in the Dungeon Master's Guide on natural hazards. I'm going to show you the content. I'm going to discuss the content and I'm going to assess the content or analyze it. So that means there's going to be quite a few steps in this process. And that means um, I should hopefully cover all of the bases you were looking for. So the first off, um, natural hazards. Even without the threats of supernatural environments, the world is a dangerous place. The following natural hazards expand on those pre presented in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is it's a cheap move to refer to another book that they have published when discussing any kind of Dungeons and Dragons 5e topic in a supplement, in my opinion. When I saw this, I was kind of annoyed. So, I did go to the Dungeon Master's Guide. I had a look in there to see what they had to say. So, on page 110 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, there is some details. And I was trying to remember how much information was useful there. And then I realized why I had sort of not paid attention to it. So on page 110 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, there are details on strong winds, rain, high altitude, frigid water or freezing water, quicksand. Okay, I wanted quicksand. Razor vine plants, slippery ice, thin ice, extreme cold and heat. And this is where I started to realize the problem. There was never much in the Dungeon Master's Guide to begin with, with regard to natural hazards and disasters. I didn't really have the meat and potatoes that I wanted. It has some of the stuff I would want, but certainly not all of what I would want. And certainly the significant things aren't there. So, of course, you get excited. Tasha's is going to actually expand on this. And they, they start strong, they really do. I would say the first one that they present is by far the best, in my opinion. And that is the avalanche. So I'm going to go through it and explain it. A typical avalanche or rock slide, so they're assuming that an avalanche performs and operates exactly like a rock slide. I don't think I agree with that. And it is a 300 foot wide, 100 foot long and 30 foot thick slide or avalanche. Creatures in the path of an avalanche can avoid it or escape it if they are close enough to the edge. But outrunning, outrunning one is almost impossible. Okay, I'll give you that. I'm going to come back to this point because it's actually quite important. When an avalanche occurs, all nearby creatures must roll initiative twice each round so you're going to have two initiatives one initiative count on 10 and on zero okay this is for the avalanche okay something's happening with the avalanche the avalanche travels 300 feet until it can travel no more so in other words it has to go off the edge of a cliff or hit a, a I guess a stone wall or a stone cliff face or something like that or maybe it's going to hit a forest or forested area, something that will slow it down. When an avalanche moves, any creature in its space moves along with it and falls prone. The creature must make a DC or difficulty class 15 strength saving throw, taking 1d10 bludgeoning damage on a failed save and half as much damage on a successful one. Okay, good. When an avalanche stops, the snow and other debris settle and bury the creature or creatures. A creature buried in this way is blind and restrained, that kind of makes sense, and it has total cover. The creature gains one level of exhaustion for every five minutes it spends buried. It can try to dig itself free as an action, 
breaking the surface and ending the blind and restrained condition on itself with a successful DC strength uh, 15 check. And you could be a strength check, it could be an athletics check. A creature that falls and fails this um, check has to do so three times and can't repeat this attempt anymore after that. So now basically, if you got three attempts and after that, you're stuck. But there is a way out. A creature that is not restrained or incapacitated can spend one minute freeing a buried creature. Once free, that creature is no longer blind or restrained by the avalanche. So this gives you the opportunity for somebody to try to get you free. And because you're spending a minute to try to um, break somebody free who's buried, there's hopefully a good chance you can do that before they wind up with too many levels of exhaustion. Because if you look at these rules, that means that after about, I believe, exhaustion level 5, you're basically dead. Okay, So you've only got 25 minutes to get free, otherwise it's all over Grover. Um, so they're going to give, give players quite a few attempts at trying to break them free. There are some problems with these mechanics, um, and unfortunately I could not just ignore them. The first thing is, what is the perception check or DC to find a buried creature in the snow? There's no mention of that. It leaves it up to the dungeon master. I'm assuming that you have to find the creature before you can pull them free, or have the designers assumed that dungeon masters should just assume that all characters are buried in the snow from an avalanche with at least one limb protruding from the snow except for their head because their head can't be protruding otherwise they wouldn't be blind uh, that seems odd i don't quite understand that that is some aspect to the mechanic that is not there and i'm sure people will ask questions of me and other people about how to deal with that i don't think that's fair I think there could have been a little bit more here. How does a dungeon master adjudicate a character avoiding the avalanche? Okay, so you've explained to me how big an area the avalanche is going to affect, but how do I work out where my characters are and what am I going to be doing in terms of getting them out of the way? There's no guidance around that whatsoever. Now, an intermediate to an experienced dungeon master will probably be able to figure that out. A beginner dungeon master will need more assistance, and that's not here. I'm going to say this though. This is the better developed hazard mechanic compared to all of the rest. Out of all of them, I feel like this is, by far, more developed than anything else. It's also a reprint from Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and I'm fine with that. I don't have an issue. Not everybody is going to go and buy an adventure book, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and if you want to have those kind of mechanics, then bringing over to this book makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's move on to the next mechanic that we need to discuss. And I thought this was odd, but it's here, and that is falling into water. So what do we have for falling into water? I didn't even think about this, frankly. I, when I thought about falling into water, how often does it come up? Does it come up for you? I may have had this show up at my game maybe twice in the whole time, like six years. A creature that falls into water or another liquid can use its reaction to make a DC 15 strength or athletics check or they can also do a dexterity acrobatics check to hit the surface <laughs> Uh, uh, to hit the surface head or fur, um, feet first so you can choose okay the idea is that I guess hitting the surface with your head is bad and hitting the surface with your feet is better um, I kind of think that makes a lot of sense depending on the height of the fall on a successful check any damage resulting from the fall is halved now I'm assuming they are using the standard falling damage mechanics and they're applying it to water and I can kind of see that uh, with regard to a certain height you know once you get to a certain height and with a fall then maybe we can treat water just as a hard surface 
but here's my problem with this. There's no adjustment for the height of a character falling. There's no mention whatsoever. So falling 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 200 feet, it's treated exactly the same. And I don't think that's a great idea. You know, how do we compare that between hard ground, falling on a creature, and falling into water? I feel like this is the sort of thing that should have been there. And all I've done is given us a simple check to try to cover something that's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Why? I don't know why they did that, but apparently they have. Next, falling onto a creature. If a creature falls into a space of a second creature and neither of them is tiny, the second creature must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or be impacted by the falling creature. Okay. And any damage resulting from the fall is divided evenly between them. The impacted creature is also knocked prone unless it has two or more sizes larger than the falling creature. So they've actually tried to provide you with a bit more detail and meat and potatoes to, to deal with some of the things and questions that you might have and have to sort of adjudicate. Here are my problems with this particular uh, piece of mechanic. How do you determine if the falling creature lands on another creature? Well, they've actually given us a, a saving throw. But it actually takes a little bit of time. If you read through the passage, it's not completely clear what's going on, okay? Because they have tied it into the first sentence. I didn't pick that up straight away, but it's actually the DC 15 dexterity saving throw. That's what you're using to try to um, get clear. What happens though if a falling creature is deliberately trying to fall onto somebody, so they're aiming for them? Do we still use this mechanic, or are we using something else? Are we using an attack roll of some kind? So I feel like that's one aspect to it that isn't completely covered. The other thing is, wouldn't larger creatures landing on smaller creatures cause more damage rather than halving the damage? Would there not be something else going on here? I feel like a larger creature weighs more would probably do more damage. Now, there is a point we have to accept that this is a game and it's not a simulation. It's not a video game. We can't cover everything under the sun. But I would say to you that the creature size adjustments seem a little wonky. I feel like there's, there's a little bit of information that's helpful, just not quite enough. It wouldn't have taken much more. I feel like there could have been just a little bit more and we would have covered everything. Okay, so those are the, the basics. Then we move on to an area which I thought was quite bizarre. Uh, and that is the spell equivalents of natural hazards. I'll read through the section, I'll show you the chart and the table, and then I'm going to assess it for you, okay? Because this should really be the nuts and bolts of the whole thing. But, is it? So let's have a look at this passage. Numerous spells emulate the wrath of nature, and you can use spell effects to re represent a variety of natural hazards. Okay, I think a lot of people may have already figured that one out. The spells a natural hazards table present some common environmental dangers and the spells may use to approximate them. So it's, it's trying to see if we can take a spell and link it up with a natural hazard that you might want to present in your game and use the mechanics in the spell description to cover that. Do they actually do that? That's the question. So let's have a quick look at the first table. The first table, so down the left we have the natural hazard, and then the spell approximation, which hopefully the spell description is covering, is there. Okay, so we've got ball lightning. Now, I don't really come across ball lightning that often. Apparently, the chromatic orb would be a good representation for that. I looked at the spell description, I didn't really agree. Um, it has blizzard, and they've selected cone of cold, ice storm, and sleet storm. And I looked at them and I, I wasn't convinced either. Not to mention, I could swear that the Blizzard mechanics actually already exist in another adventure book, and that is Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. So why did they not take the mechanics for the Avalanche and the Blizzard and transfer them into this book? 
and I'll tell you why. I think it's about space, but I could be wrong. We keep going. Okay, what about the earthquake? I looked at the earthquake spell, and I thought that there were quite a few elements to this that actually made a lot of sense that you could certainly use there because there's quite a lot of depth. It's a big passage, and it covers lots of different aspects, but there are things that does not answer for a dungeon master that you as a dungeon master are going to have to figure out. Falling debris. I didn't really quite understand why we needed that, but um, that's fine. Um, things do fall on people, and so therefore, let's let's see what we can use. So, conjure barrage and conjure volley, and neither of them felt like they were useful for falling debris. I think, suppose they could be. I feel like you would have to make some modifications and adjustments to those spells to for it to work. Then we have the flood, and control water, and uh, there's army. Uh, look. I I didn't really feel like they were hugely useful because there are lots of aspects to a flood. Um, there are some game mechanics that would be applicable, but not all of them. Fog? Well, the fog cloud, yes. Now, maybe the area needs to change, but I think the mechanics behind fog cloud would work with fog. What about the lava bomb? Frankly, I didn't feel like the fireball or produce flame had anything to do with a lava bomb whatsoever because there's always the chance with a lava bomb to avoid getting hit by it. And lava bombs don't have an enormous explosive area. It's not a fireball as such. And it's not really produce flame. So I didn't think that was a great representation. They've got here lightning. And of course they've gone for call lightning and lightning bolt but really what i wanted as a hazard is i wanted a lightning storm but they've just put down lightning and call lightning and lightning bolt in a very loose sense could be applied to a lightning storm but i didn't feel like it was it was hitting the mark either uh, meteor now they've gone for fireball and meteor swarm meteor swarm is far too powerful uh, this is a this is like a, a weaponized falling rocks thing, you know. So if we were to apply this in our game, unless you're playing at high level, you're probably going to decimate the entire party. So I didn't feel like that was going to be hugely useful either. And when you have a meteor swarm, do you really have huge amounts of rocks and flame coming down on you all at once? I don't know. I've never been in one. Maybe that's, maybe that's how it works. The Mirage. Um, so we've got hallucinatory terrain. Actually, that works. I looked at that and I thought, okay. Um, it didn't really require an awful lot of mechanical assistance, but actually that kind of works. The Proclastic Flow. And that's got here the incinerating cloud. Now, Proclastic Flow, I think that's actually re um, referring to the Proclastic Cloud from a volcano. So this is the idea that this cloud is going to hurt you. Uh, but the, the thing is with a proclastic cloud is it does a lot of things. It can It's going to push you around, it's going to burn you, and it's going to poison you. And they tend to be acidic as well. So they are, they're not just burning you with fire, they're going to be, it's, you're dealing with acid as well because there's so many horrible things coming out of a volcano. I didn't feel like the incinerating cloud spell was going to be a good representation. Radiation. Now they put down blight and circle of death. And I didn't have too much of an issue with this. Um, I don't know how often I'm going to use radiation in my game, but who knows, maybe I will incorporate it more. We had smoke and they've gone for the fog cloud again. And I did not feel like that was even remotely useful because smoke is a different monster. It is, it's a different uh, mechanic in itself. It has a lot of other things that are going on that aren't duplicated by fog. So I didn't think that spell was going to work. This one lost me. Um, St. Elmo's Fire. And they've gone with Fury Fire. I didn't understand that at all. Frankly, I got lost. I was trying to figure out what the heck they were trying to do here. They've got swamp gas and decided that dancing lights is a good representation for this. Again, I don't understand where they're going with this. Now, the, the tidal wave is a different story, okay? Because the spell they have selected makes a lot of sense. The only problem with tidal wave is 
we probably need to change the area that it's going to affect. And also too, the kind of spell effect that you're dealing with here is quite tame compared to what you would normally have to deal with with a full-fledged tidal wave. Okay, just, just my two cents. Uh, the toxic eruption, which I felt like that was... I don't know where they were going with this. I felt like that was the proclastic cloud, but apparently it's not. They have selected acid splash. I felt like that was utterly ridiculous. Maybe they're envisage their vision of what a toxic um, eruption is is different to mine. Um, I think it would have been very useful to have a kind of a description of these different hazards so that you have an idea of what you're dealing with, and they haven't included that. Um, the thunder. I'm like, why do I need thunder? And they've selected thunder wave. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Are we talking about a thunderstorm? A thunderstorm, you're not going to be taking damage from a thunderstorm, not unless there's lightning involved and you're getting struck by it. So I didn't understand that at all. Uh, volcanic lightning. Now, apparently there is such a thing as volcanic lightning, usually around the crater when it's um, exploding. I didn't really understand this. I only just recently discovered that apparently that does happen. Um, I don't know that I... I'm finding it hard to, um, to believe, but apparently it, it exists. And they've selected Storm of Vengeance. Didn't make any sense to me, but apparently they've selected that. The Whirlpool, and they've got Control Water. Um, very loose usefulness, if you ask me. Wildfire, and they selected Firestorm and Wall of Fire. I think Firestorm is kind of going to make a little bit of sense, but it's the area that it's affecting that's going to be problematic. And let's get real. We're talking about a forest fire. Wildfire must be like a forest fire, correct? Well, I'm hoping that's the case. Um, but forest fires, you know, the longer they run, the more dangerous they become, okay? They don't stay, and they're not going to stay on the same level. So the longer that fire is burning, the worse things get, the hotter they get. So we don't have those kind of mechanics in those spells. And then we have windstorm, and they've got gust of wind. Okay, all right. So there's our rundown of the information they give you. So let's look at the, the actual mechanics in a way that makes sense about how useful it will be to you in your game. The first thing I would say to you is this. This is probably the laziest part of the whole thing by the design team. These spell equivalents of natural hazards reeks of trying to save space and energy and deciding that we can just take these as reprints. It's, it's essentially like a huge section on reprinting. Okay, That means that almost nothing that they offer you is new. Now here's the positive. This table does actually provide you with really handy list of possible hazards. So if you are having trouble coming up with ideas, they have actually provided you with a whole bunch of ideas that did not exist in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And frankly, I looked through past uh, versions of Dungeon Master Guides uh, from Dungeons and Dragons uh, 4e and 3.5, and you don't really get an awful lot on natural hazards in any of those books. So this is actually not too bad in terms of a list. The only problem is spell descriptions might be partially related to the natural hazard you're trying to duplicate. But generally, generally, the mechanics will not fit for a non-magical effect. You will have to do some additional work to make it make sense. Otherwise, it will not make sense. The other thing is, none of this couldn't or wouldn't already be developed by an intermediate to experienced dungeon master. Uh, but a beginner dungeon master might find them quite useful as a starting point. I know a lot of you were looking for a lot more. There's nothing dynamic. There's nothing dynamic here. There's nothing complete as a game mechanic. We're not talking about the skill challenge. And I feel like the skill challenge would have been the perfect tool for natural hazards, and they have not utilised it at all. 
Apparently, there are some things from Dungeons & Dragons 4e we do not want to carry over to Dungeons & Dragons 5e. I don't... I, look, I think they could have done that. I think there was a deliberate reason why they didn't do it, okay? That's my, uh, my suspicion. There is so little offered on natural hazards for a dungeon master. I believe this was actually thrown together by the design team to fill up space and make it look like they had more information and material for dungeon masters so that dungeon masters would buy the book as well rather than just players okay i think that's what was going on here that they have done that quite deliberately they did not want to make the section too long they only had a certain amount of space they provided you an image and they've given you the beginning tools to do most of the work yourself and i think that was quite unfair on their part i think if you're going to do that and I know you've got to sell books, uh, Wizards of the Coast, but if you're going to do that, you should have made it clear that really all you wanted to do was provide us with the rules on the sidekicks and most of these um, optional player character stuff. You know, that's that's fine. You know, that's, that, that's what you had. And really, a lot of the other content is a second thought. And this is very much a second thought. Okay, not everything is a second thought in Tasha's, but this was definitely just thrown in there to fill up a bit of space, in my opinion. Okay, so what is actually missing from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything? Okay, the first thing I would say is the Blizzard. Okay, they actually have mechanics for the Blizzard in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Now, if they weren't worried about page count, they could have just reprinted the Avalanche and the Blizzard. Rather than just leaving the avalanche there, we could have got the blizzard from Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and you would have had mechanics for that. And I looked at them, and they're pretty robust. Okay, they do most of the heavy lifting. We wanted a lightning storm. What we got was lightning. No, we wanted a lightning storm. We didn't just want lightning. We wanted to know how we would adjudicate dealing with characters running around in a lightning storm. They're not always going to get hit by lightning. It's there's a very slim chance of that happening, right? We didn't really get the meteor swarm or shower uh, because the spell is way too powerful for what we're trying to duplicate in reality. Flood. Uh, I, kind of, I kind of give them their flood one. It's not too bad. Tidal wave. I kind of give them that one. The forest fire. Kind of give them that way. The tornado. The twister. We don't really have that. That's something that I've used in my game a few times. And I would have liked to have seen something that was related around a twister that moves around. We don't have something like that. I know a twister could be represented by an air elemental, but it just didn't feel like it was robust enough. We don't we don't have that here. We don't have anything on ri um, river rapids. So if you're traveling down a river and you're dealing with rapids and you wind up in the river and out of a canoe or off the raft, and you're coming up to a waterfall, we've got nothing around that. That is a pretty standard natural hazard. The earthquake, they did a reasonable job of that. Volcanic eruptions, I didn't really feel like they had bits and pieces here. Uh, tar pits, we don't really have tar pits in this one. Nothing there. Now, you could say, yes, they had rock and mudslides because they have the avalanche, but the avalanche is a different animal, and, you know, a rock slide and a mudslide is very different to how an avalanche would operate. Now I know we can't cover everything in any book, but there are some pretty significant things we should have seen in this book and we didn't get them. That doesn't mean that all of it is a waste of your time because it's not, okay? It does mean you will have to do a significant amount of work yourself. Okay, if you found this video helpful, fantastic. I actually have more videos on the Dungeon Master tools for Tasha's and you're welcome to go and check them out. I've got one on parlaying or talking to monsters. Okay, so there's one there and I will continue to do more videos on that topic. If you're not really into that sort of thing, that's fine. I have hundreds of videos for players and Dungeon Masters that cover every aspect of the game. Trust me, there's probably everything covered by now. Now, if you want to support the channel so I keep doing video content like this, you can do that through the uh, Patreon page that I have. You can also check out my um, Amazon affiliate links down in the description, 
or the merchandise shelf underneath my video. Under all my videos there's a merchandise shelf or just watch my videos, that's fine too. Make sure to share, like and subscribe, hit the bell button to be notified when I go live and when I publish new videos and I go live a lot. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.